Uh, my name is Drew. I've been in the industry for over 30 years, uh, public sector for 13 and, and 18 years tomorrow with Pollard Water. So uh, definitely uh, been uh, started out painting fire hydrants and changing out water meters and I've done lots of flushing throughout my years. Uh, and here locally, I'm actually out in Washington State, so on the West Coast, and I teach a lot of classes for certification um, for operators with their certifications. So uh, flushing and uh, and all of this has become second nature. So welcome everyone here today. If uh, due to our time limitations at the end of our pro presentation, there is our contact information, and I welcome each and every one of you to reach out to us if you have further questions or you'd like to explore some product or whatever, we're there for you. So, Denise? Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for spending your time with us today. My name's Denise Buckley, and um, I have been in the industry for 18 plus years also. I, my happy place is fire flow testing of hydrants. Uh, I also handle electric gauges, level products, things like that. So hopefully today you'll get some good information to start setting up some flushing programs on your own. Thanks, Drew. You bet. Little housekeeping here today. If you guys could uh, uh, keep your phones muted unless you're gonna ask a question. Um, at the top of your screen, you can raise your hand, just click on the hand button uh, and uh, we'll get to you answering, uh, have you uh, pose your question at that point. Make sure that your chat button over the far left there, um, make sure that that is active because you'll see questions that I'll pose on the right and we should be good from there. But um, if you're not speaking, if you could please make sure to mute yourself just in case there's any background noise that would be appreciated. Thank you. What we're going to cover today is uh, basic on um, flushing and introduction to flushing. This is a, a in-depth topic that we can spend you know, hours on talking. So we're just going to touch the surface on it, uh, get some creative thinking going, uh, understand why we flush in the industry, when we flush, some environmental impacts of flushing, and what are the tools needed. So there are a couple of different types of flushing we're going to talk about. The methodology here, it's conventional. Conventional is something that we've always known since dawn of time. It is basically there's no specific order or methodology to our approach to flushing. Uh, conventional flushing offers, um, uh, basically we're out there, we're, we're working in flushing an area that is either a customer complaint, we got a water quality issue, or we're going to be working a neighborhood and there's really no rhyme or reason to our approach just basically it's hop from this hydrant or blow off to the next location it's really common there's absolutely nothing wrong with this a lot of utilities still practice this type of methodology of their flushing um, it has been proven that conventional flushing versus the next one we talk about unidirectional flushing is not as effective it can take longer um, and use more water in by achieving the same goal. So that leads us into unidirectional type of flushing where there's actually a rhyme and reason. There is an order and a process uh, to us approaching our flushing. You flush a distribution system from the source outward in one direction. So from our wellhead, from our tank, wherever we're gonna be for, out to this furthest point in our distribution system. Um, flush from larger pipes to smaller pipes. Okay, so again, typically where our source is, that's going to be our distribution, our, our large main, and then from there our offshoot. So it makes makes sense from source for this out from large pipe to small pipe. Um, set and maintain a minimum flushing velocity. When you when you go in through a lot of uh, um, classes at uh, conferences and stuff like that, and they talk about flushing velocities. Um, AWWA has a minimum of two and a half feet per second for a flushing velocity. And what that means is it's basically the scouring power, um, the rate at which we flow the water through our hydrant or blow off, that rate will, how effective it is in scouring and cleaning that water main. So understanding what velocity is there, 
Um, so again, AWWA, you know, the minimum is two and a half feet per second. I know a lot of municipalities and PUDs that are out there that actually, you know, make an SOP of uh, three feet per second or even higher. Um, so that's something to understand. And, and that's where this slide comes into. We're not going to do any math today, but just basic, basic waterworks math in our certification. We understand Q equals VA. If we know the size of pipe, we can figure out the area and we know the flow rate that we're flowing, you know, if we're flowing 350, then we can figure out from there what the velocity is. So it, easy enough that we can do the math um, when we're developing our program. So understanding why utilities flush water, um, basically, ultimately to improve water quality. So we're going to minimize customer complaints. We're always going to flush if there is a customer call that, hey, I've got a color issue, cloudy water, or it looks brown, uh, my water tastes horrible, what's going on, or it smells, you know, it smells like rotten eggs, whatever it be. Um, so we're going to be out, we're going to be responding to that, Johnny, on the spot. We're going to want to improve our water flow. We could have water restrictions. So we want to improve our water flow and then also to manage our chlorine residuals. And understanding that one is key. And we'll touch on that a little bit later in today's presentation. But managing chlorine residuals can be a difficult task depending on the age and layout of our distribution system. As we get smarter in the years with our distribution systems, we figure out what's going to work best by looping, you know, having loops and, and less dead ends. And it makes things a lot easier for us to manage those chlorine residuals, especially out at the furthest points within our distribution system. Um, so why do utilities flush water lines here? We talked about the scouring power in water mains. And this here, you can see in the lower right picture on this is actually tuberculation within, uh, within a water pipe. And this is actually fairly mild. We might see it more, um, uh, you know, in our, in our own house plumbing or galvanized lines where you can see that it's, you know, seven eighths full of tuberculation. You really have a flow restriction. But this here is just basically from minerals in our water, uh, buildup on the sidewalls, you know, and the amount of flow that goes through our pipes. But we've got everything from, you know, customer complaints where they got the red rings in toilets or sinks or in our laundry. That could be from, you know, increase in iron and manganese. Um, we could have a color. Um, we could have a taste issue depending on where our source is. It could be groundwater. Um, or surface water. So I know I've worked at one well where regardless of how much we pumped, it smelled like rotten eggs and we actually had um, a chlorine gas injection at that location just to deal with the smell um, uh, of that. So there's a lot of reasons why we're out there. So these are the most obvious that we see. <clears throat> when we're out there flushing, and we'll touch on this a little bit more here in a little bit, but when we're out there flushing, where are the eyes and ears of our entire distribution system? We're going to be on every valve, every hydrant, blow off, um, you name it. So we're going to be able to start doing some mapping. And, and it, let me rephrase that. Instead of hydraulic mapping, maybe just a good documentation of everything, every location and hydrant that we're going to be on. We're going to make good notes. So we're going to basically say at this location, We've got a great flow rate. This is what it is. We got flow pressure. This is what our residual flow pressure at this flow rate is. Um, this hydrant, so we're going to note on it, uh, needs work, you know, et cetera. So we're going to be out there. And we're going to be creating this massive uh, file of data. And that's what is commonly known as hydraulic mapping. So um, Denise is going to be talking about flow testing here in, in a couple minutes. But uh, um, <clears throat> that's really going to play into when we do hydraulic mapping and that's critical information so we're going to get to our next question here this is kind of a poll question for you here so make sure your little chat button is is open at the top and um and we'll be good there so i've got a question for you first question so per awwa see 651. Okay, it's not coming up there. It's okay. Not a problem. I'll read it to you here. There you go. Thank you. Per AWDA C651, what is the minimum flushing velocity? So again, this is what AWWA states that a minimum that we would have to do. 
Anyone want to throw a comment up there? Throw up their answer. Give you a couple seconds. Very good. Everyone's saying C. Awesome. All right. So two and a half foot per second. It really boils down to each utility, what your hydraulic system is capable of doing uh, and what your area and also the size of pipe is going to have a direct impact on what you're trying to do. But the minimum for AWWA that they're stating should be two and a half foot per second. But that's more of a recommendation. All right. Excellent. We talked about uh, the hidden benefit to flushing. Um, when we're out there and we're looking at every valve and hydrant, we're making that priority list, not only for our current task at hand, but also from a maintenance standpoint. So we come across a hydrant that we want to flow and the operating nut isn't working. Last thing that I, any of us want to have is to be on the news. There's a fire and the fire hydrant there didn't work. I've seen it, even some local cities here that are super large, city of Seattle, city of Bellevue, you name it. They've had those in the news and it's, it's nothing that any of us want. So you have the ability to mark that, put it out of service and get it going. We've all dealt with overlaying new streets where we've had valves that have been covered over. So having the appropriate tools for that, uh, Ferris mag locators to be able to find those valves, mark them. And you're gonna wanna do this if you're, if you happen to be out there flushing, great. But if you're maybe in an advanced team prior to a flushing program, you can identify some issues and redirect your resources to get that done before you start your flushing. Um, and then the biggest thing too on that is our valve cans, the conditions of our valve cans, they could be full of mud, sand, leaves, you name it. So having the, the appropriate tools to, to get ready and be prepared to move forward, that, that's ultimately what needs to be done. Flushing considerations. So the time of year, time of day, these are some basic common sense. I've worked in many utilities where we've had flexible schedules depending on the scope of work and where the work is being done it makes sense during uh, it makes sense during the day um, that you might be able to hit more of a residential area because everyone's at work there's less cars on the street um, and versus a nighttime in a residential area where cars can be parked on valves. But nighttime, maybe down in, in a heavy uh, urban area, downtown district or something like that, you may want to flush during the nighttime there just because less pedestrians, less cars, you name it. And obviously, time of season, we're not going to be flushing during the dead of winter. It's, it's frozen. We're going to create more problems than not. And again, also on the flip end, we're not going to be at the peak time of summer when we're dealing with water conservation issues. So usually spring, fall are, are, you know, this time right now of the year, this is when you're going to see it increase in a lot of flushing operations. All right, this is a really uh, hot topic for discussion, and, and this comes up almost on a daily basis with myself, with customers. And that is basically, how do I deal with dechlorination? We've seen these regulations have been out for years. It's been stated in the Clean Water Act. And on a federal level, it varies from state to state as far as the enforcement goes. The gist of it is, is whenever we flush water into the environment, so that's you know, out of the hydrant, onto the street, down that storm drain. It used to be out of sight, out of mind, didn't have to worry about it really need to worry about where does that water end up? Does it go into a stream, river, lake? Does it go out into the into the forest, into the sticks? So we need to understand where we flush our water to and the environmental impacts that have it. Chlorine is dangerous for any aquatic life. And uh, so it's been recognized on a federal level that utilities flushing is a critical function for water quality. So they recognize it used to be that, sorry, zero, you know, no chlorine discharge at all. And they're like, hey, wait a second, we have to do this as part of our work. Uh, this is part of water quality. So they came up with, and this is what's stated in the Clean Water Act itself, so acute levels and chronic levels. So acute uh, being short-term, uh, like in an emergency emergency situation, an emergency is an emergency, but still, they still outline it at 0 0.019 parts per million chlorine. And that's not much. Um, uh, you know, it's pretty much down to zero at that level. And then long-term being chronic, if you're dealing with, it, with an area at 0 0.011 parts per million, it's really hard to dial something in, you know, uh, 
basically less than that. So uh, that to me, that's pretty much at a zero level. So we have the ability in our industry to dechlorinate when just potable drinking water, we're talking about potable, and that's four parts per million or less, as well as new construction, so at higher levels. But we have the ability, the, the tablets, the, the chemical, um, to get that taken care of. All right, let's move on here. All right, what's the minimum chlorine residual, parts per million for potable water? Anyone? All right, again, on the right-hand side there, okay, it looks like people are coming up with 0.2, letter B, absolutely. So that is the minimum uh, chlorine residual for potable water is 0.2 parts per million. So you can see that that is higher than the permissible exposure limit when we discharge water. So hence why we are required by law to, to dechlorinate our flushed water. So you can see how those intermesh with each other. You like that intermesh? <laughs> All right, I've talked enough. Denise, take it away. Thank you. Sorry, I have a light, slight lag here. So, a publications, AWWA Manual M17 provides really good documentation. It gives you everything you want to know about hydrant flushing and flow testing. Um, it's good to have some documentation in case there is an authority having jurisdiction besides yourself that has questions or needs information. There's a lot of generic information in here. Uh, the equivalent to this publication is NFPA, National Fire Protection Association Manual 291. The publications are identical in the verbiage used for flow testing other than one sentence. NFPA requires a 20% drop between static and residual, and AWWA says 10 PSI. So just be aware of that if you're on the water side or the fire side, that your documentation may change. And that's something you can come up to on your SOP also on how you want to handle it. So now let's talk about more equipment. There's multiple different pieces of equipment to use. So you can do flushing and or flow testing. Again, going back to what we're going to do with mapping system and laying out guidelines is going to help you decide what equipment you want and to what degree you want to lay out your system. So this equipment here you're looking at is called a Hyde Pro kit. It's an all-in-one kit. It provides everything you need to take your statics, your flows, and your discharges. It comes in a case so everything is in one place. It doesn't get lost. You can't, you know, you can lock it so people don't borrow things like gauges and take them out uh, and not return them. The only thing it doesn't include is a wrench. And we have lots of wrenches. This kit is the hose monster line. And the reason that it's different is on the previous side, you saw the equipment hooked directly to a hydrant and it had a swivel diffuser. This unit uses, or excuse me, this kit uses a length of hose. So you guide the water from the hydrant down to the street and discharge the water east and west. Either is good, they both have fixed pitots in them so that you can get your flow rates. These kits, again, are all complete. They have your static for residual pressure gauges on your test hydrant, your flow. Um, they come with instructions, basically everything you need in one kit. This is the same as the little two and a half inch diffuser you saw a couple slides earlier, but it's large diameter. So it's going to handle a lot more water. Again, as you see in the picture, it hooks directly to the hydrant. It's on a swivel so you can aim and shoot. This helps eliminate property damage, but you know, in sensitive areas, you're gonna have to deal with it. You know what your system is, you know what you need to do. Sometimes you can put down a piece of plywood. Sometimes you wanna go to the other system that uses a length of hose and completely redirects the water. Uh, this particular unit is available in four, four and a half, and five inch stores. And again, it's going to move a lot of water. You can flow well over 2,000 gallons a minute through here. This is another basic setup. 
Again, all in one, everything you need. This is a handheld pedo, which you can kind of see in the picture. It also has your cap and pressure gauges for your static and residual. Um, it, it is a handheld pedo, so you're going to have some flexibility and some vibration on the gauge because it's basically only good as the person holding it in the stream of water. Um, I prefer the other equipment only because it has a fixed pedo and that helps stabilize it. So it takes out some of the guesswork. As you see in the picture with the guy holding the handheld pedo off a nozzle, you know, if he moves it all or wiggles, that's going to affect your discharge flow. And again, you know, dealing out with your mapping once you decide the situation you want to do. If you want to do hydrant flow testing and you want to do maintenance and you want to do this and you want to do that, you're going to want accuracy. And that's going to help you hone in and get those most reports so that when you take your extrapolation down to 20 PSI and rate your hydrants and color code them, you can do it in one step and know that you have confidence, you know, in the equipment that you're using. Um, another piece of equipment is the large diameter hose monster. It's called the big boy. It's the same as the other, obviously much larger, it has a bigger diameter. It flows 2,700 gallons a minute. Uh, it, again, it has a fixed pedo in it. It actually has what's called a pedalless nozzle. So any rocks or debris are not going to damage the unit. Uh, the gauge reads in PSI and GPM. So let's talk about that for a second. When you have equipment flow devices, regardless if they're a Hydrant Pro or a Hose Monster or an Akron or any device, even the nozzle of the Hydrant, each device has its own coefficient and orifice size. So if you have accumulated flow charts that read in PSI and GPM or gauges. Example, Hydrant Pro has a gauge that reads in PSI and GPM on the discharge for your water flow. You can't take that gauge and put it on a different piece of equipment that has a different coefficient. Sounds a little confusing right now, but it's something just to keep in the back of your mind. So gauges are not interchangeable when you go from a host monster to an Akron or a Hyde Pro, things like that. PSI is PSI, that doesn't change. But the GPM that's imprinted on the face of the gauge usually has the coefficient built into it. So it is not interchangeable with other equipment. Okay, with that being said, hopefully I didn't lose you guys on that one. With that being said, again, this is the big boy hose monster. And again, it's the same as the little one. It just flows a lot more water. Thanks, Denise. So those devices that you've been showing us are, are flushing devices, but also flow test devices. So twofold, you flush the water while you can be doing flow testing, correct? Absolutely, yes. Okay. Which leads us to the next slide here, which is a slightly different product, and we've all seen this. This is uh, Pollard's LPD-250, and this is a flushing diffuser originally designed for flushing only, and it still is for flushing only, but it also offers dechlorination. One thing to point up here from the previous equipment, this is not a flow test device. It has a pedo on it. It has never been tested for flow test purposes, so the percent accuracy is, is unknown. Um, good question, Tim. So, uh, and we'll, we'll address that here. So, um, this particular device <clears throat> with the LPD pedo kit on it, it will read both, as Denise mentioned, both in flow PSI and GPM. But this was designed for an accountability standpoint. So, when people were doing their flushing programs, and they're trying to figure out their accountability of their system for their water loss, they can, at the end of their flushing season, they can determine how much water that they use. So this gauge would show, you know, you're flowing at, you know, 400 gallons a minute, and your, your stopwatch when you're out on a particular location, you're there for 30 minutes. You, your log that you keep throughout your flushing program, you can say that for my flushing season, I use, you know, 14 million gallons of water for, the three months of flushing, whatever it, whatever it is, but you can deduct that from the water that you've either pumped in the ground, pumped out of the ground, or purchased from a neighboring utility. 
So, and then the difference is your unknown uh, unaccounted for water loss. So anyway, the design for this is for accountability only, not for flow testing. So the other cool thing about this device is it's a lock and load, you know, super simple dechlorination device. It takes dechlorination tablets, um, either sodium sulfite tablets or, or ascorbic acid vita dechlor um, tablets. And basically you put tablets in the device and you flush away. And the nice thing is as so long as you're flushing potable water, not new water main flushing, uh, because you're dealing with super high levels of chlorine there, you're 25 parts per million or 50 parts per million. And with tablet chemistry nationwide, competitor-wide marketplace, there is no tablet out there that can dechlorinate the higher levels uh, that would constitute for new water main flushing. So hopefully that, that answers your question there, Tim. So I like lock and load because you add a tablet and while you're flushing or in between flushes, you can just, you know, when your tablets get down about 50% their size, you just add another tablet and you keep on flushing. Having this in the upper right picture there is on a hitch mount. So the nice thing is for your flushing crews, all they have to do is from point to point is disconnect and connect the hose. Your device is safely and secure on your vehicle. So it's an anchor point. Um, on that one, a question popped up here is the coefficient already figured into the pressure gauges. If your pressure gauge has a duplex read on it uh, that gives you flow PSI as well as a GPM, then yes, that gauge, uh, that range, the GPM is based off of a particular coefficient that that device dictates. So that's why you don't want to you know, put this gauge on another device and ooh, I know what my GPM is, that it's not going to be accurate at that point in time. So always keep the duplex gauges, GPM and flow PSI on the prescribed unit that it was meant for. Okay, that way it can help you with your accuracy. One last thing about this device is for flows up to 1,250 gallons a minute. So it's specifically designed for your side port and fire hydrants and or, or, and or blow offs. And people have been known to put, you know, hydrant one on the pumper port and flush with two. And this has been out for years, which led to our next device is our truck flush unit. Um, and the truck flush unit was originally is just a flushing diffuser and was for large port flushing. And, you know, we were thinking, well, shoot, a lot of people, whether it be their flushing velocity requirements, they can't achieve those velocities out of their side port. So they have to flush out of the pumper port. And they're like, well, I really like the LPD 250 because I can put tablets in it and dechlorinate. Well, we went back to the drawing board on our truck flush and we came up with a dechlorination kit. And uh, so now this device has been tested with, with Vita Dechlor. You can put tablets in this device and you can flush in the, off of your pumper port. So uh, it has an adapter to take it down to the two and a half inch if you want, but for four inch, four and a half inch stores fittings, you name it, but you can get much higher flushing velocities um, and higher flow rates, you know, up to 2,500 plus. Um, and dechlorinate at the same time. So a super cool product where you can flush, dechlorinate, not for flow testing though, okay? Just remember that one. All right, next Drew, slide. can I interject something real quick? Please, yeah. So there's a question out there about using the LPD 250 for flow testing and documentation. Um, there is a flow chart that can be sent to you for the pedo formula calculation, but you need to know that it varies. Okay, so it's not a constant. And that's one of the reasons that you don't want to use it. There's back pressure using tablets, the amount of tablets, the type of tablets, so and, and the velocity that you're flowing at. So it makes it not a very accurate device for flow testing. Do we have customers out there using LPD for flow testing? Yes. If it was a fire life safety issue, that's probably not the equipment that I would choose. I would use something with a fixed pedo that isn't going to have the back pressures on it. Um, do we have customers and municipalities using an LPD to do flow testing? Absolutely. And at least the important thing is they're going out there and they're cracking open those hydrants and 
they are flowing water and getting flow rates and things like that and marking their hydrants. And, and that's one of the most important things that we can have, you know, going back to what Drew started with is that you never want to crack open a hydrant and find out that there's no water in there in an emergency. So, you know, I, I don't want to underplay what Drew is saying, but, um, it, it's not the first choice of equipment that I would use when you're doing this mapping system and laying it out. I would definitely go with something like a Hydrant Pro or a Hose Monster line that has a fixed pedo and it takes out all the questionable of your flows. Thank you, Drew. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, no, it's great addition and thank you very much for that. You know, it's 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 unfortunate because we're such limited to such time. You and I could talk about this for hours. So again, just reiterate for those of you that this is an important subject to to discuss, or you want further information on this, please get a hold of either Denise or I after this class or any point in time. Reach out to us; we'd be happy to talk about this and and your application specifically. So thank you for adding in, and please do it anytime. Um, I wanted to touch on automated flushing systems. So we've got in the very beginning the reasons why why utilities flush, and that is for um, you know uh, chlorine residual management. So when you're dealing from you know your source is way over here and your dead end way over here, there's just not much flow. It's hard to pull that fresh chlorine residual to that area because the demand is, is so mi minimal. So we do certain things in our distribution system where we find those dead ends and we either loop them so we can get better flows. We re-engineer our distribution system. Sometimes we don't have the funding to do that or hydraulically it just doesn't make sense. So we're trying to find tools and means to address the issue and automated flushing systems help to help those hot spots that you've got to do on a more frequent basis versus just your regular flushing crew. And we can do that. We can send a crew out there, but this doesn't require a crew. So you, uh, yeah, this one here is a Kupferly item. There's other devices out there. I just wanted to use this as an example. You can leave this alone in a neighborhood and it's attached, you can put dechlorination tablets in the bottom of it. There's a lot of little add-on options and features, but it's kind of like a sprinkler system programming um, thing where you can set the frequency and duration. So I can say, I want this to flush every Wednesday and I want it to flush for an hour or for 30 minutes. Um, so you could set that up and going, and there are certain security things that you could set on there for from vandalism. It's not 100%, but it, it's better than than most out there. But they are EPA approved for water conservation uh, for use during non-freezing seasons. That's something you definitely need to kind of keep an eye on there and keep in mind. Cool thing now that nowadays with our wireless technology, you know, Bluetooth controller, so you can do things a, a lot more remotely and set things up, but there are solutions for just about every application out there, and we're seeing an increase in utilities recognizing those hot spots and, and exploring automated flushing systems. So. so when we're out there flushing, I just want to reiterate you know, it's really important when we're operating and flushing our devices, flow test or, or just standard flushing, Hydrants are designed to be operated fully on or fully off. Do not use the operating nut on a hydrant to, you know, manage your flow rate. You want to manage your flow rate by means of either a gate valve that you add on to the port itself, and that could be a gate valve on the side port, or there are gate valves for the pump port you can put on there, or by the auxiliary valve in the street for that hydrant run. Those are the two acceptable means for managing the flow rate out of a hydrant. When you do a flow test, your flow test should always be a hydrant fully open. Um, if not, you have to make sure that you notate and have you know reasons for that, but fully open. So gate valves on, on a flow test also may may prove to be a hazard because they will you know can create a vortex and or resistance that so could affect your flow test reading so that's where the auxiliary valve in your street if you had to regulate that uh, that would be the the preferred location the other thing too is is these days when we're flushing and we're we're 
Uh, we've got a lot of stuff hanging off of our hydrant port. We've got you know hydrant meters, backflow devices, hoses, dechlorination diffusers, and everything. So it's a lot of stress on those those threads, on the device and on the hydrant itself. And then when you add water, there's some significant vibration. So the wear and tear of our threads on our hydrants is, is something there. So having a stand, uh, make sure you use some, you know maintenance on your hydrants is really important. Nice thing too, some of the devices that Denise is talking about, it, it basically connect a hose and the hose to the ground and then you can attach your devices. That's gonna work the best for um, you know, preventative maintenance there. Denise, anything to add on that? No, that was perfect. Thank you, Drew. Oh, you betcha. All right, so we're gonna talk about data loggers for a minute here. Data loggers have huge benefits you can put a data logger on a hydrant and leave it there for days at a time to monitor your pressures. They will help you find, you know, water loss. You'll see spikes in valleys and things like that because you're going to start off with a point of a static pressure and then go from there. You can see, you know, just a little bit of movement on the graph there. Um, but data loggers are meant to be seasoned. They're left out on a hydrant. Some have locking features, some don't. Sometimes you have to put a bag over a hydrant market out of service with letting the fire department know it really isn't. Again, that's an SOP that you'll create yourself and, and handle it with your personnel. But data loggers provide PSI pressure readings for you. There are digitals, there's other devices that don't have a display on them. Some are Bluetooth. Uh, some are remote. There's a multitude of, of product out on there, excuse me, in the industry that we can work with you. But the advantage is this, you can record your data and save it. You can use it when you're flow testing. You can put one on a hydrant. It's going to be your test hydrant, which is your pressure hydrant. It's going to record your static and your residual. Static being the highest PSI on the device. And then when you go to a second hydrant to do your flow testing, that pressure hydrant, your test hydrant, is going to show your residual, which will be the lowest point in PSI on there. So the neat thing about this is, is if you are doing a two hydrant test, because there are two types of hydrant tests, a fire main capacity test, which is multiple hydrants, or a fire hydrant capacity test, which is a single hydrant. So when you're doing a fire main capacity test, you can put this logger on your test hydrant and you can go to another hydrant with one person only and do the flow testing because you're recording all the data needed on the other hydrant. This allows you to use one person instead of two or three. It allows you in municipality fire departments not to have multiple pieces of equipment out on the street where you can do it again with a single person. So sometimes you have to think outside the box and look at the advantages for the equipment that's out there. And again, ourselves or your Ferguson guys will be happy to help you and assist you. We'll answer any questions and help you set up equipment that's best for you. Um, so data loggers also can be used, again, as I mentioned, for water loss. You are recording data. You can set them to ping once, you know, once a second, once uh, every 30th of a second, things like that. Uh, they are programmable through software. Some are Bluetooth. Some have extraordinary programs. Some are very simple. So depending on where you go and what you want to accomplish will help you decide what equipment is best for you. But uh, extremely accurate and, and very well used material. Okay, so poll question number three. Where would you use a data logger in lieu of a pressure gauge? You've got multiple choice answers. I'm C and C and D. Awesome. Yay. <laughs> I know you're out there. I appreciate that. That's awesome. Perfect. So the answer is D. You can use it again for recording results. 
you can use it in flow testing. You'll find it extremely beneficial. Uh, some data loggers can also be used in valve boxes and things like that. So like I said, get creative, you know, think outside the box and there's lots of things you can do to improve your system and provide data. Thanks guys, that was awesome. This is another sample. We've got a whole new product line here and we are able to provide remote monitoring software and hardware solutions for you. Depending on what your need is will depend on the equipment, but we can easily work it up for you. And again, this is this is absolutely way to go. This is going to make your system provide you all the data you need. So if you have an alarm or you've got low pressures, you're going to be able to see all this in a heartbeat. And, and the whole idea is keeping your job simpler and a more pinpoint operations for you so that if something does happen, you can react a lot faster. So I want to talk about hydraulic mapping again a little bit. Drew talked about it also. Um, sometimes it's a little scary because it's a lot of work and I'm not going to, you know, kind of smooth that one over. It is. The first time you do it, it can be a little rough, but I promise the benefits are just amazing. So when you're doing hydraulic mapping, you're gonna set up a section of town of your municipality in walk order. You're gonna start with the hydrant, we'll call it 001, and that's gonna be the first hydrant in your system. It could be the one closest to your water line in, whether it's a tank or a subdivision, Maybe it's the biggest line that you have, and then you're going to work your way into the next hydrant. And again, remember that this is going to be in walk order. So the next hydrant in line is going to be 002. So 001 is your first hydrant. That's going to be your test hydrant. Your flow hydrant for testing and or flushing is going to be hydrant number two. You do your test, you set everything up, you go on. The next hydrant, your main hydrant is going to be 002, and then the next one will be 003, so on and so on and so on. Um, what you want to do here is you want to take a few, you know, whether you're working with a team or not, but you want to decide what are the requirements. When you write an SOP, are you just going to go out and do a fire flow test and calculate your results and run your extrapolations down to 20 PSI and color code? Or are you going to do maintenance? Are you going to do winterizing? You know, you can take this to the extreme so that you can set up everything that you want to accomplish, whether it's work orders, painting, maintenance, again, winterizing, and so on and so on. So give it some thought. But I promise you, the first time you do it and get through those struggles, the next time will be a breeze, and so on and so on. And the data that you accumulate and you're able to record is just going to provide oodles of information for you and give you better control of your system. Again, looking for water loss. You know, we're all accountable for this. Somebody's paying that bill. These are the things that are going to help you prevent that and get to maintenance sooner than later. Um, not necessarily always waiting for that customer to call and complain because they don't have water pressure. You know, things like this. Well, these, these worksheets will help you immensely. Uh, a lot of systems, they're You've got your GIS, you've got your maps, you've got your blueprints, whatever, but you can take the results from some of these software programs and you can actually link them to your GIS so that you can just click on a hydrant and see all the data. You can see what it's rated at, the color, da, 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 what valves are connected. So, you know, take some time and think about it. Start simple, do a very small section, whether it be a subdivision or just, you know, four square blocks. Start small and work out from there. Um, Drew, do you have anything to add to this? No, you just said it right there to me is start small because it is very intimidating. But start small and, and learn from a small sample and go, is this the information that I'd like to have on file? What what else could I do? And every utility is different. I've worked at utilities where they've got, you know, measurements, you know, for valves in their, their mapping, you know, for their area. 
in case they ever get lost, overgrown, overlaid too. So valve markers. So it not just your flow data, but other physical data is really important as far as your hydraulic mapping. So start small. You're out there, you're the eyes and ears. So every time that you're out there, you can update information, reference prior information. And it's also it could be something as simple as, hey, when I flow from this hydrant, be careful because the storm drain capacity can't keep up with a flow rate over 500 gallons a minute. And, you know, you learned you learned the hard way the first time because you flooded Mrs. Robinson's front yard. So these are notes, too, that you can put in your hydraulic mapping for your area. So it's not just flow data. It's not just maintenance issues. It's, it's everything. So it's a great resource. Start small. It is intimidating, but you will appreciate it. Excellent. Thank you so much for that, Drew. So here is one of the software programs. This is called Hydrant Soft XL. And what its purpose is, is to maintain your fire flow testing and provide results for you. Uh, it's a simple program. It is extremely user friendly. You can use it on your phone right in the field like you see on the graphic. You can use it on your computer you know, in the office where you maybe give hard copy work orders out to the guys and say, fill in the blanks. Um, it is a cloud-based program. There is not an annual renewal fee. So it's very cost-effective, very, again, very simple to use. And this is just some of the data that you need. And this is all basic fire flow testing uh, data. You're going to put in your static, your residual, your coefficient, your orifice size, because remember, every coefficient and orifice is different per device that you're using. So once you fill in all the blanks, there's a really neat feature that will show you your calculated flows and how much water you used. Uh, we just did an expansion on this software, so I'm very, very happy to say that you can now provide data and you can export it into an Excel sheet and it will give you that water used report per hydrant. So there's a little bit of work that you need to do, again, on a software program. There's a little bit of a learning curve, but it's not that difficult. This is very economical and very user friendly. So just an FYI for that. Um, the software is not hard to use. Thank you for that question. Uh, again, a little bit of a learning curve because it is a software program. So there's always going to be something. Um, I've got manuals. I've got everything. It is not very difficult to, to use. Uh, the screens are very clear and precise into the information that you need to have. Most all of you have knowledge in fire flow testing, so you know what points you need to get. Again, static residual flow and so on and so on. And, and those are all basic things. This all goes back to NFPA and AWWA of what you need to do a proper test. So Denise, a question on that software. I noticed that we were talking about that yesterday. One of the latest is uh, Latin Lawn, so I mean GIS. Um, um, can you expand on that? Okay, so yes, you can do longitude and latitude on there. There are fields for that. Uh, you could incorporate a device, whether it be a simple device that you get. Um, gosh, I don't even know where to get them anywhere. They have a magnet that you put on the bonnet of the hydrant, and they will actually pull in data from satellites and give you the points. Uh, again, you can also take it to the extreme. We have a lot of monitoring software issues and hardware programs now. Um, but this one is very simple. And again, because of the new features, you can export into an Excel and save your data. You can hand it off to a contractor and so on and so on. Um, because it's in an Excel sheet, you can also add columns. The columns that you add will not be in the software, but you're able to export them onto your GIS and link them. Got lots of questions coming in here, so this is good. It's Q&A time. Let's, uh, Denise, is there a free trial for the software? There is not at this time. However, if you reach out to me, I will get that accomplished. 
Um, so whether you're going to reach out through your Ferguson rep or through us, I will get that. I will get that accomplished for a 30 day trial so that you can test it out with live data. Uh, I do have the manual on our site, pollardwater.com, so you can download the manual and it shows you every single field. You know, and that's a good place to start, but of course I'll be happy to answer any questions. It is again, a simple program and um, it's designed for ease of use, whether you use it in the field, you know, or on your desktop. Another question, can the software be used when you have two flow hydrants? You can, but you have to do the math because one and one doesn't equal two in flow testing. So, so it's still the, the standard is you add GPM and GPM, you come up with the PSI and you, you put that in. So it's not as easy. It's a little cumbersome, but yes, it can be done. You just have to do the math. Okay, cool. The next question, flushing once a year versus twice a year, my thoughts, really dependent on the utility. It's you're basically going to have to look at water quality, the condition and age of your water mains. Um, that's going to dictate your frequency. I mean, we all know when we have dead end mains, you know, water quality issues or chlorine residual management, we have to flush that more frequently. So same sort of methodology thinking and how to approach that. A unidirectional flushing program in large municipalities is never ending. It's, you know, you start it at, you know, January 1 and you're still flushing throughout the full year. You're basically working the system from, you know, the source outward. And when they're done with that, they start back up. So, again, really dependent um, on what your available resources are um, for employees, uh, the, the necessity and the need. So, um Anyway, I'll have to leave that one up to you on that one. There's no cut or dry answer for that one, but really dependent. So I'm going to jump in real quick, if I may, and ask, uh, somebody's asking about the price of the software. The Hydrant Soft XL is a one-time purchase regardless of the size or the amount of hydrants you have. And again, one of its greatest features is, is that there's not a renewal fee for the cloud-based software. So you don't have an operating system, which is, you know, extremely awesome for us. Does that help? Thanks, Drew. Yeah, you betcha. So there's a question here. Um, our fire division has the responsibility of flushing all city-owned fire hydrants. Uh, they uh, progress through the city limits at a rapid pace. Is there equipment or method to make available to them quickly to determine two and a half to three foot per second is achieved during flushing? I may have uh, missed. You can. Uh, so specifically, Tony, for your utility there, if you if they've got a map book or something to work off of or some sort of hydraulic mapping already in existence, you can easily... Uh, determine what the minimum flow rate they need to achieve for this location, for this hydrant or this leg of water main. So, I mean, you could easily just write that in on a, on a, on a map page if need be, if you don't have anything electronic. But it, it basically just goes back to, you, know, you have to figure out, you know, if you know the size of the pipe, you have to figure out the area of the pipe, okay? Um, and then, you know, and if you're trying to determine, um, you're trying to determine your flow rate. So Q equals VA. That goes back to that original slide there. Um, that you can solve for velocity. So the Q being the flow rate equals velocity times the area, and then you can set velocity by itself. So the easiest way for the, the fire department to measure that would be some, you know, they need to be able to, if they know that they have to on this particular run flow at least 350 gallons a minute, they need the ability to determine what their flow rate is. So having a device that can tell them a flow rate. So it's gotta be, you know, pedoed and they can figure out what that is. It helps if the device itself has got a, a duplex gauge that has a GPM on it. So that would be the most simplest. Um, I would be more than happy to talk to you about this a little bit more in depth, um, uh, of course, based on your application. An example for that would have been like the Hyde Pro, the yellow swivel diffuser that had the GPM on it. So, um, and um, 
and then the Hypro kit itself. So that may be the best device for the fire department to use is that Hypro kit. Okay. All right. Thanks, Tony. What are the questions we got, Denise? I think I'm good right now. Is there another one? My mine is lagging a little bit. It looks like another one's just coming in. What is the no. cost for the software? Uh, I believe it's 500. I think it's $495. And again, okay. it is based um, one time purchase. Mm -hmm. um, you get one license per user. It's up to you if you're going to share the user or not. Uh, but it's not based on size or quality of quantities of hydrants. So regardless, if you're a small town fire department uh, that goes out and does it once a year and you've got maybe 50 hydrants, or if you're a very large municipality with thousands and thousands of hydrants, it will work for you and there's no limitations on it. Great. Before I pass this back to Thomas, Denise and I just wanted to thank everyone here today um for being part of this we welcome any calls questions we work very closely with your uh, outside salesperson from ferguson we are a family uh together so if you've got questions you can funnel and you've got a relationship with your outside salesperson by all means ask them the question they can get a hold of us or you can reach out to us directly but um we have the available resources between ferguson and pollard to be able to get you taken care of so again thank you from denise and i thomas 